It's Friday, September 28th. In a decision that clears the way for the Supreme Court to hear the main Ayodhya title case and likely deliver a judgment before the 2019 general election with arguably major political implications, a three-judge bench of the Apex Court on Thursday held that there was no need to refer to a larger bench the question of whether mosques are essential to the practice of Islam. Had the Supreme Court decided that the 1994 Ismail Faruqi judgment required to be reviewed by a larger bench, the main Ayodhya title matter could only have been taken up for final hearing after that case was settled. In 1994, in the Ismail Faruqi judgment, the Apex Court had held that the mosque was not an essential part of the practice of the religion of Islam and hence its acquisition by the state is not prohibited by the provisions in the Constitution of India. So, why did the court on Thursday rule against review and will the Ismail Faruqi observations impact the Ayodhya title suit? But first, what is the Ismail Faruqi case? Months after the Babri Masjid was demolished in December 1992, the government passed the Acquisition of Certain Area at Ayodhya Act. Under this act, the government acquired the land in and around where the Babri Masjid stood, stating that the dispute has affected the maintenance of public order and harmony between different communities and that this step was necessary to maintain public order and promote communal harmony. Dr. Ismail Faruqi challenged the act in the Supreme Court. One of the arguments made against the act that allowed the government to acquire land was broadly that denying access to the mosque, which is a place of worship, is violative of Articles 25 and 26 or the freedom of religion. It is in this regard that a five-judge Supreme Court bench in 1994 held that a mosque is not an essential part of the practice of the religion of Islam and namaz can be offered anywhere, even in open. Accordingly, its acquisition by the state is not prohibited by provisions in the Constitution of India. Let's come back to the present. This Supreme Court three-judge bench was hearing the main Ayodhya case, which is the challenge to the Allahabad High Court's 2010 judgment in the contentious dispute also known as the Babri Masjid Ram Temple case. The Allahabad High Court had in 2010 ordered that the land be divided equally among three parties, the Sunni Waqf Board, the Nirmohi Akhada and Ram Lalla. That was challenged in the Supreme Court. During the hearing in the Supreme Court, Muslim groups argued for reviewing what they said was sweeping observations of the Apex Court in the 1994 Ismail Faruqi case, as it had and will have a bearing on the Babri Masjid Ram Temple land dispute, they contended. Not required is how the Supreme Court ruled on Thursday in a 2-1 verdict. The majority judgment stated that the Ismail Faruqi verdict had held that all temples, mosques, churches, etc. are liable to be acquired by the state and is not violative of the freedom of religion and that these observations are only in the context of land acquisition. The court also said that the observations in the Ismail Faruqi case are not relevant to and will not impact decisions in the present case, which is the title suit. Justice Nazir's dissenting view was that what constitutes essential practice of religion needs to be considered in detail by a larger bench. The Supreme Court will now hear the main Ayodhya title case from the 29th of October. Adultery is no longer a crime in India. Characterizing Section 497 of the Indian Penal Code dealing with adultery as a chauvinistic, paternalistic notion that treats women as chattel, a Supreme Court five-judge bench struck down the section, saying it violates Article 14, which is equality, and Article 15.1, which is discrimination on various grounds including sex. What does Section 497 say? Whoever has sexual intercourse with a woman who is, and whom he knows, or has reason to believe, to be the wife of another man, without the consent or connivance of that man, such sexual intercourse, not amounting to the offence of rape, is guilty of the offence of adultery. 
and shall be punished with imprisonment of a term which may extend to five years or fine or both. So, it is only the man who is deemed the offender and not the woman. This law can be invoked against the adulterer only by the husband of the adulteress. It does not provide for the wife of the adulterer to seek prosecution. It is not considered a crime if the husband of the woman consents or connives to sexual intercourse between another man and his wife. Interestingly, only sexual intercourse with a married woman amounts to adultery. Sexual intercourse by a married man with an unmarried woman, divorcee, widow or sex worker does not. So, the patriarchal notion of the right of the husband over the woman's sexuality and bodily integrity is reinforced by 497. In effect, giving the husband the right to treat his wife as a passive sexual being with her consent to the sexual act becoming immaterial. On Thursday, the court held that mere adultery cannot be a criminal offence. Adultery may not be the cause of an unhappy marriage, but a result. It will be tantamount to punishing people who live in an unhappy marriage. In case of adultery, criminal law expects people to be loyal, which is a command which gets into the realm of privacy. Although, if any aggrieved spouse commits suicide because of a life partner's adulterous relation, then if evidence is produced, it could be treated as an abetment to suicide. Section 497, the court held, is based on the doctrine of coverture, which holds that a woman loses her identity and legal right with marriage and is violative of her fundamental rights. The doctrine is not recognized by the Constitution. The court also spoke of sexual autonomy of women within marriage, saying partners in a marriage should have respect for each other's sexual autonomy. You're likely to have come across this viral video clip of a woman police constable hitting a female student in a moving police vehicle, allegedly for having visited the home of a male Muslim friend. Another official can be heard saying, you prefer Muslims when there are so many Hindus around. The video was shot while the woman was being taken to the local police station with three constables and a member of the home guards. Both students were detained in the police station for a long time. Now the Merit police have attested to the incident having happened. Sub-Inspector Satish Kumar, the officer in charge of Merit's medical police station, told us it was the home guard driving the vehicle who had recorded the video on his mobile phone, but isn't certain who put the video out in the public domain. Kumar said he was taken aback at the behavior of his staff. We organize periodic briefings on ways to deal with students and the concerned woman constable has worked in this police station for more than a year now, he said. After the video surfaced, the Uttar Pradesh police suspended the three constables seen in the video while the state government has started an inquiry against the home guard. But how and why did the police detain the students? The two of them were in a colony close to the university that is home to many students when members of the VHP and some residents barged in and allegedly assaulted them. Balraj Dungar, a leader of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad in Meerut, denies having assaulted the students but admitted to barging into the house and calling the police. The police, locals say, are now playing an active role in moral policing. Two Democratic women senators have written to the Trump administration asking him to revoke his decision to cancel work permits to H-4 visa holders, a majority of whom are Indian. H-4 visas are issued to the spouses or minor children of H-1B visa holders, and Obama-era benefit allowed H-4 visa holders to seek employment in the United States. Citing that in 2017, 94% of H-4 visa holders with work authorization were women and 93% were from India, Senators Kamala Harris from California and Kirsten Gillibrand from New York wrote a letter on the matter to Homeland Security, asserting that rescinding the H-4 rule would disproportionately target South Asian women, cause economic, psychological and personal harms to more than 100,000 professional women, their families and create a permanent barrier to employment, reinforcing a harmful stereotype that women do not belong in the workforce. Most H-4 holders are spouses of tech workers and live in higher cost areas such as Silicon Valley or Seattle, where having two incomes is not a luxury but a necessity, they added. 
The Trump administration believes that the H-4 and H-1B policy is being misused by companies to replace American workers. That's it for today. But right before we leave, we're happy to share with you your morning fix has won the gold at the South Asian Digital Media Awards for best use of online video by the prestigious World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers. Thank you for watching.